Hello, all you Biconics Wrestling nerds out there, and welcome to another edition of the Collision Collective Review, your weekly AEW Collision Review team. I am one of your hosts, Mikey, and joining with me this lovely morning is, of course, one of my other co-hosts. You know him. You love him. Macho Rodriguez himself, Luis. Hi, my friend. Good morning. Hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm so excited to be able to be on here again with you. I really enjoy these Sunday powwows that we get done to talk about Collision. Uh, Collision, once again, has been the A show. Uh, unfortunately, we are missing our other <laughs> Puerto Rican poppy, but, you know, hopefully he'll pop in here soon. Hopefully. And if not, Adolfo, we love you. And, you know, we'll, we will get us together because technically, we're just going to put this out of the way. We're not going to wait to the end of the show. So there's no, going to be no Collision review next week because it's All-Star Weekend. So Collision is not taping next week. But we will be back in two weeks for Collision. So mm -hmm. I'm going to miss Collision for a week. I'm like, what am I doing with my life? That's cool. At least we'll be able to watch the Slam Dunk Contest. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I mean, I make it no secret. Outside of professional wrestling, I'm not the biggest sports fan, even though I keep up to date on what's happening yeah. with it. But you know what? It, there's people who enjoy different sports, and I'm not going to knock them. Absolutely. Because support, like what you like, and don't be a turd as Brian Zane on the internet. That's says. right. So. <laughs> That's get, how you do it. Yeah. <laughs> So before we dive in like piece by piece of this collision, overall, while I enjoyed it, I feel this collision was doing two different things. We're trying to, you know, build established stars, also building towards revolution, mm -hmm. which has been, which is, this show was a little bit all over the place in terms for that, because I can see we're building some stuff. Then we're continuing to build for your three big championships. And I love Eddie Kingston. We'll talk about it, but the crowd did not make it helpful. I was like, wait, is he challenging Danielson to a match? Is this happening next week? Like, when's this going on? Then I had to pop onto the social media to get the graphic. I was like, oh, never mind. And we'll talk about it when we get there. But I enjoyed the show, but I felt like a lot of it was all over the place that we are building towards matches, but we're also teasing future matches at the same time. Which I don't mind because that's been my biggest complaint with AEW in general is like the wrestling, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Storylines, non existent mm -hmm. right now. Agreed. So well, they're slowly trying to get back to what we knew. I don't even want to say peak because the company is still going, but storytelling is what got me involved in AEW, what I really, really enjoyed. But right now, it's slowly getting there, but we'll talk about it when, you know, as we go on. So let's just jump straight into it. it. Collision opens up. Collision opens up this week. We have another iteration of the BCC this time with Mox and Claudio Castagnoli taking on two more CML boys in Star Junior and Espinje. I've been enjoying the last month or so the CML boys coming in and doing stuff with AEW, and I haven't heard anything. But at the same time, I'm like, please don't go. Don't let this be the last week. Keep mm -hmm. coming, please, 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 please. <laughs> I'm just like, no, don't leave me. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. I like how they started off on the mat, and it was like Moxley and uh, Star Jr. Um, the match itself was pretty solid. I don't know if I'm going to be controversial here or not, but am I, am I crazy in thinking that Claudio has really lost a step? No. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up, because part of my notes while I was watching this, I'm like... I can't tell if Claudio is like hurt mm -hmm. or if something's bothering him, but he was not in this match the way that he normally is. And I've stated here before, I love Claudio, I do, but his style of wrestling is hit on yeah. me. But he was kind of like lost yeah. a little bit during certain parts of this match. Even the finish was very which, odd. Yeah, um, I don't know. And even afterwards, when he went for the fist bump for Mox, and Mo well, Mox wasn't paying attention, but Claudio was like, "Yeah, okay." Yeah, it just like, feels like he. Claudio, lost. are we okay, dude? It just feels. I don't want to say this word because I feel like the P word is a really big thing, but it just seems to me like he's lost his passion for the business. Like it, he doesn't seem as invested as he did. You know, like this feels like the Claudio before the bar. 
where like he was just in the shuffle and he's like yeah he's on tv and he's doing whatever but like he just needs that shameless i don't know that's what i feel like we're watching but i do feel like moxley has really fought hard to get back to being the john moxley that like people initially fell in love with and i'm very excited about him proving that he's one of the top workers on the planet oh for sure it's been a weird effect like i agree with you in the sense that watching claudio in this match i feel that he's lost mm -hmm. a step i don't know if anything's going on behind the scenes but whatever it's going on i hope claudio kind of works mm -hmm. through it and i hope he gets better if it ends up being he's just in his head like listen we here at the Biconics advocate for the overall physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental health of all our professional wrestlers. So whatever's going on, we hope Claudio recovers, he takes care of it. He, if he needs to take some time to deal with certain stuff, then by all means, go for it. Yeah. And it's been nice to see Mox kind of, I don't want to say I have been, like been less enthused by Mox, but because of how much he's been on my television screen, in these hardcore death type masses it's kind of like lost a shimmer for yeah. me but i'm happy to see that we're just getting wrestling mox which is one of my favorite iterations Agreed. and before we talk about the quick thing that happened after the match i will say one of my moves in this match was from star jr he went bounced off the rope ran through to go through the middle rope and while he was going through the middle rope he used the leverage to do like a tornado spin <laughs> into BCC, which I thought was fantastic. <laughs> Look, I'm a sucker for flashy moves, and that's one of my favorite things that I've enjoyed with CMLL is I get my mixture of high-flying action and, of course, you know, the technical side of Lucha Libre. I kind of chuckled, too, because it's been a consistent thing with all the CMLL boys in these multi-person tag team matches is that they have to remember to tag in mm -hmm. because <laughs> normally they're not... They don't normally have to tag in when they do tag team matches back to Mexico and all that stuff. So it's a little chuckle, but BCC picks up the victory here. Mox gets on the mic. He puts over the CML above boys and says, if anyone in the world wants to face them, that any top tag team in the world want to face BCC, they just need to step up. Which then keys FTR bald and FTR aggravated assault to come out, which that Thing is getting very interesting with some news that dropped earlier in the week so we'll see what happens with that we'll talk about it later but FTR and BCC have a little bit of a face-off before they get into this massive brawl and then the ROH locker comes out to separate the two I'm like what happened the AEW locker room was very thin tonight like because I'm looking at everyone I'm like these are all ROH yeah. talent where are the AEW folks yeah I uh <sighs> I got it. I really feel like I'm not, I hope I'm not stepping on any toes by saying this, but I really feel like Tony Khan and AEW utilize Ring of Honor the way WWE utilize indie workers in the security sense. Like, oh, let's bring these guys in to get them on TV so that we can like use their faces and stuff. But I don't think he respects Ring of Honor at all. Like when I see things like this and I'm thinking like, why is this a thing why are they coming out to separate these like aew talent like i i don't know I, it just frustrates me I'm, I'm a i'm one of the the original fans of ring of honor like be, seeing them in rawway new jersey and seeing them like in philly and, <clears throat> and it just doesn't feel right it doesn't feel like th this company's taken seriously and i feel bad for the entire staff and the entire crew yeah <laughs> i'm debating because if you if you got a sneak peek in the ring of honor group chat between the four of us that review the show yeah let's just say that you better be ready to dive into the trenches because we go off <laughs> on a lot of stuff yeah it doesn't feel right and i and i want to say something that's i don't think it's controversial at all being someone who's actually learned how to work and someone who's actually like studied the business as long as i've studied it i can be a thousand percent about this and i can say this with my chest out a lot of the workers that are in ring of honor are better than the workers that are in aew so i don't understand why they're treated like it's fcw back in like the early days with like the prototype john cena 
Like that's what it feels like. They're treated like developmental. And I'm thinking to myself, do you have any idea the talent you have on this roster? Like, I love Tony Storm. I've been a Tony Storm fan since she was Tony time before her WWE, WWE run. She couldn't hold a candle to Athena. Like, there's nothing she does in the ring that touches what Athena does. Like, Ember Moon, for the people that don't know. Like, this woman is one of the best in-ring performers on the planet. And and we're talking men and women. And, and, and she's just... Like, how has she not come up with her title and worked more Collision? Or worked more Dynamite? Or even Rampage? Like... Your, is your plan to keep her in Ring of Honor for the rest of her career? Because she's a top talent. Like, I love Diana Perrazzo, but I feel like that should be Athena's spot. She should be working with someone like a Tony Storm. She should be working like a Serena D. Like, I don't get why she's there. I truly don't. And that's just my, my personal opinion. Yeah, and that's something that we've been saying for a very long time over the last year or so. <laughs> Is that Athena is the best Ring of Honor champion, not women's champion, but champion because she's been carrying that this rebrand of Ring of Honor all through last year, and she's the only main ch title champion to defend that thing on a daily basis or weekly basis, I should mm -hmm. say. Now, granted, she's been off because she's dealing with some injury type of stuff, which shouldn't keep her off television for a long time. And I'm honestly loving that while Athena's out, Nyla Rose has kind of stepped in to kind of be the... <laughs> Listen, I don't know how everyone else feels, but we in Ring of Honor and here at the rest of the Biconics boys, we love this version of Nyla Rose we're getting in Ring of Honor love right it. now where she's just being her literal internet mm -hmm. self. Love it. And just being ridiculous and silly with a bunch of things. But yeah, I don't know. I get that they use the Ring of Honor talent for the security purposes for the pull apart brawls because Collision and Ring of Honor share the taping schedules. But every time we have one of these on Collision, I'm like, what happened to the rest of the AEW locker room? Like, what? Where'd they go? Like, I know there's people there. I don't know. I don't know. It's very strange. Good morning, Adolfo. Good morning. <laughs> Como estamos? <laughs> ah, bien. Bien. Por algún razón, yo pienso que. De la diez y media fue la hora que estamos aquí, pero that's my bad. <laughs> no, that's cool. You're good. We're here. We just finished like, talking about the first match. We're about to talk about Danny's match. <laughs> yeah. So really quickly, Adolfo, we just got done talking about BCC versus Star Junior yes. and Sting Hit. Yes. You know the CMLL boys. Yes. What are some of your quick thoughts? <laughs> um, I thought it, I thought it was a, a, a great match. Uh, I thought it was a lot of high energy. Um, I am kind of bummed that the CML uh, CMLL uh, got the got the L. Um, you, you know, it's though Mystico got the win on Rampage. I don't I don't I don't know, man. It I, it's it's hard seeing our our hermanos. Uh, getting uh, taking the pin yeah. like that, um, but if it's if it's telling a, a bigger story, then I'm down for it. I think that uh, Mikey said it best last night that um, we would like to see this story keep going, you know, um, and not just be like this one-off uh, flash in a pan. Um, and I had thought that I had read on on Fightful Select that the CML the CMLL was actually uh, challenging. BCC to come down to Mexico City, yeah. Uh, to wrestle, uh, was that a thing that happened, or did I get my my? I, I, I believe that actually is part. part of what happened today. I believe that uh, Moxley talks about it about going to Mexico. Um, you know, so that that is where we're going next. I mean, it'll be nice Excellent. to see this version of John Moxley in Mexico and seeing yeah him work out there. But you know. <clears throat> I, I don't know, maybe for the first time in my life, I guess I'm going to say this out loud, but maybe his tag partner should be Willy Ryuta because the, 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 the shell of Claudio that's been working with him, that guy is not the, the Yeah, normal. Yeah, it seems like Claudio has gotten into a rut of just being the dude that, that picks people up and, you know, uh, tornadoes them, you know? Yeah, but it, um, it's so strange too because we just watched Big Bill 
in in like for the past month big bill's been showing us why he was in that four-way universal championship match like yes he yeah. showed us like why he was working with a guy like brian in the other company there's yeah. this guy if not for his substance abuse issues this guy would be so much bigger in the cup in the wrestling business but obviously yeah. he took a couple steps back so we know that right. big guys can work and that, that's what i'm so curious oh. like I, I mentioned to mikey that it feels like he like he's lost his passion for the business yeah well and that's that's the other thing too uh, you know about claudio is we saw him throughout the continental classic mm -hmm. put on some really good matches some really strong matches so we we know that he's a lot more than just running around and like an uppercutting dudes and and picking them up and, and and twirling them you know uh but it just it seems like when he gets in with bcc and i don't know maybe it is just a bcc thing um but when he gets in with bcc he gets into that rut as i'm this is all i do i pick things up and put them down when we know that he's he's capable of so much more because he had yeah. glimmers of that in the match you know uh, like there was the one um Oh man, I forgot what move it was. Um, but you know, yeah. it, it, he we had glimmers that that the, he still has it. But yeah, yeah, you know, maybe you are right. It's maybe Wheeler Yuta and John Moxley are the ones that should go down to to Mexico City. And yeah, like because I had so Brian, I feel like Brian would be good for down there, but he has his own feud going on. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And like I like I told Mikey, my big thing is is I hope that if BCC does go down to Mexico City, I hope that they air it in the US. I uh, I don't want to not be able to see that match. Yeah. Uh, because I, I I am with f for for all the um like the grumbles that I have, overall I feel that this whole CML CMLL B, uh, BCC AEW feud thing i feel like it's been a good story you know yeah like i'm in and i'm invested and i and i do want to see the the last match in mexico city if that's the last match yeah i agree and that's it for sure and then briefly adolfo the only other thing that you missed is ftr and bcc brawl yeah <laughs> at the end yeah yeah what do we oh. what do we think about ftr coming out in all black uh, so I did not see this step happening in the next feud for either team. Um, look, the in-ring ability is going to be fantastic, but oh, I'm very ridiculous. interested oh, yeah. to see what, what the narrative that they're going to build around this. And specifically, BCC is supposed to go to CMLL. I feel that FTR is a minor pit stop before we get there, right. probably. Right. We'll see. I think this is just a feud to carry out for both teams heading into Revolution because even though we haven't said it yet, and until I see the official match graphic, I think this is going to be a match that's happening at Revolution. Well, we've got to give something to do for both teams, apparently. So, well, the the only reason um, that I just said that, maybe I'm looking a little too much into it. I do that from time to time. Um, <laughs> but when I saw FTR coming out in the black t-shirts and knowing that the story that they, that they have been running with the House of Black, where the House of Black has been like, you know, come, you know, come join us. And usually FTR wears brighter colors. Uh, I don't know if that, if if that's signaling maybe that House of Black has gotten into uh, FTR a little bit, a little bit, you know. And like, are we going to see some some House of Black machinations in there mm. with? FTR, I would love for FTR BCC. to give, yeah. We, I would love FTR to be a little more. I don't want to say heelish, but you know, be a little more aggressive yeah. than they are currently because yeah. they do great matches. But well, and just you know, I didn't think about that. And, but that was that's just an interesting thing. right. And just just because one last thing, we know that there is black, bad blood between House of Black and BCC that is yet to be resolved. Yeah, so I'm still waiting on that punchline, but right. we'll see if they, we ever get back to it. That's it. So now that we, so now that we've caught up on all that, so now we move forward mm -hmm. with this crazy train because then we get into our next match: Daniel Garcia taking on Shane Taylor. 
<laughs> I'm torn because I love Daniel Garcia. But again, my little ROH heart continues to get upset at the fact that mm -hmm. ROH talent is being utilized on Collision to lose like this, yeah. but neither here nor there. But as putting that aside, I enjoyed the match. I I figured that this was just to give Daniel Garcia a win, which would translate into what we got later in the show when he came back out again to talk to a certain person. Mm -hmm. I thought this was all right. I know what I'm getting with Shane Taylor, and I think Shane Taylor is an excellent worker. I thought Daniel and Shane did a pretty decent job. Not necessarily my favorite Shane Taylor match because I still like some of the other ones that he had. Like the one that he had with Mox a couple weeks ago is probably one of my favorites on Collision that Shane has had here on the roster. But I thought this was a pretty decent match. Not necessarily my favorite, but I didn't think anything was bad with it per se. And it served its purpose because it gave Daniel Garcia the win here. So gentlemen, thoughts on Danny and Shane mixing it up in the ring. Um, I I believe that now now we're in that stage where we are doing the 2023 version of Orange Cassidy. Tony Khan and and AEW have made it clear that Danny is the guy this year. It is very clear he's being put in top position. I fully expect him to beat Edge next week. I or Adam Copeland. I don't believe that this Adam, is where Adam we stop. I, <clears throat> yeah, Adam Adam Copeland. Don't want to get sued. <laughs> Apologize. And. Um, yeah, the way I'm looking at it is this has been a slow journey to get here. But now that we're here, I mean, this kid is improving week by week. It is it is super clear for him to go out there and to put on a, a match with Shane Taylor. Shane only works with the veteran of the veterans. He doesn't go out there and work guys like this. Like Daniel Garcia has probably been wrestling maybe as long as this company's been active. And he is slowly but surely just showing how amazing he is now he wins with different finishes now he's doing like yeah. the classic technical wrestler thing like he's not just winning with his version of the scorpion deathlock he or uh he's actually he won with a leg lock like now he's got different false finishes and he's doing really well he's been able to mix his whole you know uh dance gyration or whatever with this character and it works so now it's like become his signature like if there was a video game and i needed to power him up this would be like the the you know the yeah, the, two the, button yeah. to get him going yep like yep. and I, i'm like i i love what i'm watching of him again i this uh this is the second time where they've slapped ring, ring of honor in the face here you know first by having them be security and now by having shane taylor go out there and take this out but honestly i have to i think we have to be clear danny danny's the future of the business or, or this company at least and it's exciting to watch because they're finally building their own talent yeah after um after we got done with the ramp because we talked about the a the the roh um stars coming up and and then being cannon fodder for the uh for the aew um crew and I feel that you hit the nail on the head uh, for for as much as a, a hard pill that it is to swallow. Watching Daniel Garcia win last night um, over um, Jane Taylor. Shane Taylor. Taylor. Why was I thinking uh, Tiger Style? Uh, Lee, uh, sorry, Lee. Well, Tiger Lee, 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 Lee Moore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What did we say? Yeah, because Lee Moriarty, oh, Tiger Lee, Style Lee yeah, Moriarty is with yeah, Shane. Yeah, because he's with part of Sh Chantel Productions. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, to, to see him win, to get the win over Shane Taylor, I, I think sent a bigger message than putting him in there with just like jobber number two from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from Las Vegas or, or, or wherever, you know. Um, it was, match-wise, it was a good match, you know. Yeah. Um, I, and... Yeah, I feel it, it helps to further uh, Daniel Garcia. Uh, and the, the reason I had my phone out because I, I was checking um, the rankings because I think the, the new rankings came out. Um, but um, this also, I feel, will uh, pad his status in the ranking mm -hmm. um, as well, uh, which, you know, I'm new to the ranking system for AEW, so I'm not sure like how, how set in stone 
it yeah. is or if it's just kind of like a you know the pirate code code it's just a guideline more um yeah. but um but yeah no, it was it was a good match it was a good match it was a good match yeah i agree it was nice that was pretty much it so I don't know what was happening in the ring for this next segment because for the first half of this Eddie Kingston promo, the crowd kind of the crowd audio overtook what Eddie was trying to say. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know what's going on in the ring, but you know, we're gonna get through it. But backstage, we have Eddie Kingston with Renee. And so Eddie Kingston cuts his promo real quick. You know, first he's you know is the genuine good dude that we know, you know, wishing people better all that thing that kind of stuff like that but more importantly then he lays out a it challenge for brian danielson mm -hmm. says that i want to have a match with you and though the words were not exchanged i was like is this just to have a match are we doing championship on the line eddie like what's the deal and essentially he throws in this little extra thing where the one of the stipulations is if eddie wins danielson has to shake eddie's hand at the end match fast forward to social media later <laughs> in the evening as i open up the instagrams is it we get the official match graphic that it is going to be eddie, eddie versus yep. daniel sin for the continental crown championship so that's on mm -hmm. the line and then of course the handshake is still a part of the deal and here over here in my head i was like until i see that official graphic i'm not going to confirm nor deny what's on the card mm -hmm. so so do we think this is... I'm looking forward to this match. I, I mean, I am too, but do we think this is where Eddie Kingston uh, drops the Continental Classic title? No. Mm, I don't think, think so. No, I okay. think this version of Brian Danielson is the WrestleMania 23 version of Shawn Michaels. I think he's made it very okay. clear. He, he wants no championship. All he wants to do is have really good stories and help put people over. I don't think he wants okay. to be a champion of any kind. I think uh, I think this is the best way to squash the Eddie Kingston can't work. The, uh, I don't know if they like how they feel about each other backstage. I know Eddie is very, um, you know, clear in his messages and stuff. Like, but yeah. it, it feels to me like Brian is doing everything in his effort to help get Eddie to the top of the card to make him. So hopefully, maybe one day he becomes the AEW World Champion. And um, right. that that's kind of how I'm looking at it here. I was more interested in if the story is going to move this way with their whole, like, using their EVP stuff. I thought it was interesting that Eddie Kingston shouted out the Young Bucks the way he did. You know, talking about what they did to Sting and Darby. And I, 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 was, I thought that was weird because isn't the whole Young Bucks thing that the crew doesn't want Sting there anymore. They don't want old talent there anymore. They want to push them out so that way they can be like the main thing. I felt like we got two storylines in one promo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really interesting. And okay, so real side tangent before we get back to this. Now that you bring this up, I feel that that part of the story has kind of gotten lost in a little bit because me and Adolfo talked about this last night because the EVPs were on you know, Rampage when we... You know, on Friday yeah. and when we reviewed it, we talked a little bit about it. So obviously, we all know that the direction we're heading is that Sting and Darby are dropping those titles, presumably to the Bucks <laughs> at Revolution, which you know we already know. But now that you re-mentioned the fact that they wanted to put you know younger talent over like the vets and the people who've been in this industry for a long time, I had forgotten about that aspect of the story because it seems like they've also kind of forgotten that aspect the story yeah. a little bit and what i'm hoping is is that after the bucks to pick up the tag belts again from sting that we continue to then bring this narrative piece to the forefront he's like all right we're going to fight all of the old timers as i put it in air quotes because i know they can beat me up in real life and i don't want that <laughs> but yeah kingston dustin there's a whole plethora of people on this roster that we can go forward with, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that, but back to what we saw on our screen, Eddie and Danielson is, I'm like, oh, please give them like 20 minutes. I want to see this mm -hmm. match so bad. Yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah. I don't care. I'm an Eddie Kingston Mark and everybody else can bite me on the 
<laughs> there's actually I way more it. Eddie Kingston fans than people believe. I, I think there's just like a yeah. like a two percent of people that don't like him. I don't I don't understand why. I don't know what he's done to to get such hate. Yeah, I, I don't internet wrestling. I, I yeah. I anyways, Adolfo, you were saying. I think. My, this is my personal opinion um, that it boils down to he's not your stereotypical like loud champion mm-hmm. you know flashy champion he goes in he gets the work done uh, you know a lot of the times it's not flashy he can be flashy when he wants to be uh, but most of the time you know he comes in uh, he just and, and throws down a slobber knocker of a match and then walks out and the matches are great matches you know, it's, it's, it's not that they're not good matches, uh, but I think uh, that that vocal minority that doesn't like Eddie Kingston, you know, one of the things that that they, that bothers them is that he's not like, you know, f- he's not flashy. He's not he's not your MJF or your Samoa Joe, you know, or your Orange Cassidy. Because, uh, you know, if, if you look at the other champions, they all have this very distinct, like, billboard style. But, like, Eddie mm-hmm. Kingston, not, not, like, not so much. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, so, Eddie Kingston is a piece of graffiti artwork on the side of a brick wall, <laughs> whereas all your other champions are going to be on the billboard. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. It's still there. It's still getting the message across, but Eddie is the closest to the ground than our other champions are getting to be. Yeah, but uh, Macho, you're, I, I think you're 100% correct that uh, it's really more just a loud minority um, of people that do not like Eddie Kingston. Yeah. And I feel like he's just gotten so much love over the past year, too. Like, it, it used to be so much hate towards him. It was like, why is this guy on my screen? You know, and you would hear such, like, negative things about his body. But then all of a sudden, it's just like, yo, this dude could work. Like, he's talented. He's yeah. amazing on the microphone. Like, you know, I, 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 I'm definitely a fan of his. I'm curious. I, I love his match with Brian. I love every yeah. match he's had with Brian. I love his matches with Moxley. I hate with a passion his matches with Cesaro. I think the, those are awful wrestling matches. But I think that's because Cesaro is just not good anymore. <laughs> so. and, uh, and and just really quick, speak, speaking of body type, uh, Eddie Kingston is a prime example as to why uh, Alice enjoys AEW so much more than um, other wrestling promotions. Uh, because there's a... And she said this numerous times. There's a re- there's representation of different body styles, mm-hmm. you know, and he's part of that representation. Yeah. So, I I just I I, I feel that 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 says something, you know, from not a from from someone that's that's new coming into wrestling and you know doesn't isn't in the wrestling sphere, but like actually you just you know it just is watching it for entertainment. Um, for someone to say that, uh, I think. Uh, is an important point to uh, stick out there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So once this once this segment happens, like I look at the timer on my screen, I was like, dang, we're already like 30 minutes into the show. I was like, this was a good, this was a fun, you know, 25% of the show. What's next? And then we're just going to kind of speed run the next four things because it's just like quick match and then three backstage segments. Before we get to our next longer match. So we're going to do rapid fire for this one. So after the Eddie Kingston's promo, we get. I appreciate that we kind of the ru- removed the word handicap for these time matches <laughs> in a weird sense. I was just like, oh, I I think this is the first time we said it. But this is a two on one match. Brian Cage, once again, the Outrunners are once again on collision to serve the purpose of getting thrown around and squashed. I'm gonna be completely honest. I feel the Outrunners looked better against Hook than they did against Cage. I don't know if it's because Hook is like closer to their height stature because Brian Cage is massive, like height-wise and built-wise. And the Outrunners can hold their own, 
but I feel that there were certain parts of this match that didn't click. And I get this, this is supposed to serve as a squash match, but I wanted more, not just for the outrunners and me being biased as an ROH person, but I've seen better squash matches for Brian Cage, and this was not one of my favorites of his, but again, it serves the purpose. Brian Cage picks up the victory because the important thing is what happens afterwards after Brian Cage. Listen, I enjoyed the Prince Nana dancing with the mascot. That, sh that shit was hilarious. I loved it. And then I yelled at my screen for Brian Cage. I'm like, you big meanie. <laughs> like when he decked the poor mascot. But the important thing here is afterwards, I don't even want to say a brawl because it looked very uncomfortable with Hook and Brian Cage trying to fight their way backstage because Cage dropped Hook twice by accident. I was just like, I don't know what that was supposed to be. You're just like, powerbomb. Oh, wait, let me put you down. Okay. Let's do it again. Oh, never mind. I got to remember we're on the stage, not the ring. Somebody's actually going to get hurt. And then they brawl backstage. So Adolfo, we talked quickly about this on Rampage. We appreciate that Hook is getting more storylines outside of just doing squash matches. Mm -hmm. And we're ha I am happy to see Brian Cage on my television screen because I feel like he is underutilized a lot of the time. And he's a great worker. With that being said, I'm still looking forward to Hook versus Brian Cage whenever we get it. But this entire match and everything that happened was very clunky to watch. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, rapid fire. Yes. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I really I'm so sorry. But... Match, yeah. I don't, yeah, yeah. 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 Rapid fire. Next. It's like it was a squash match. It's like two minutes. Like we're good to go. Yep. Then we from here, we get the und so the Undisputed Kingdom requested time with Renee to talk to Tomohiro Ishii. So I'm going to be up front for the rest of this. I may slip back to what I've been calling him because it's just Ishii, not Ishii, apparently, that, like I've been saying for the last year and a half. Well, no, it's, it's really hard because for phonetically, there's two eyes. Right. And, <laughs> it to, and to be fair, when he comes out, the ring announcer does call him Ishii. So I need them to figure it out because yeah. they're confusing me. So we'll, we'll use both iterations. Right. Again, I felt like this didn't really serve too much of a purpose because... The Undisputed Kingdom, most you know, specifically Roddy, reestablished the history between Ishii and him and the whole chaos faction in New Japan. And they kind of just talk. Roddy just basically tells Ishii after tonight, it doesn't matter if it's you or Orange, whoever I'm facing, you better be ready for revolution. I'm like, why was this here? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I get it. I do. But at the same time, I was like, this was a weird place to put it. And I feel like this is the part of the story that we did not need. He already trounced Rocky Romero and threw him through chairs last night. I feel the Undisputed Kingdom didn't need to show their face outside of coming out after the main event to, you know, beat up on Orange Cassidy. Because I thought when we got this, I was like, okay, so Undisputed Kingdom is going to come out after the match. They're going to beat up on Ishii. And then, you know, continuing the trend we've been seeing of the Undisputed Kingdom dismantling Chaos slash Best Friends, leaving Orange Cassidy by himself. It's a smart heel thing to do. Spoiler alert, that did not happen after the main event. And in hindsight, this little promo segment did nothing for the overall story. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, next. Robert Strong, so it's like, nah, whatever. You're right. You have a cool backbreaker. His, he has... That's a, yeah. His in-ring is never a question for me, but I've never liked his character work because, like, the charisma just needs a little bit of a booster shot. Like, the, it's the same way I felt when he was in Diamond Mine in NXT. I'm like, the Creed's and Ivy Nile are running this thing. You're supposed to be the leader, Rod Roddy, but that's besides the point. I, I'll be honest. I liked him more when he had the neck brace on because he was just so over, same. Yeah, he was so over the yeah. top. It was like awesome. Now that the neck brace has come off and the whole you know undisputed kingdom thing has started, it's it's like he's pulled back and he's like, now I'm brooding and coming after you, Orange Cassidy. Blah, you know, and it's just kind of like, see, I need this blah. brooding energy to be interjected into AJ Styles right now because that's what AJ's similar gimmick is right now. It's not working out, but tune into the SmackDown review to hear my thoughts on that. <laughs> Um, from here, we go back to in the ring with Mr. Tony Chavone. Um, <laughs> I can never say his name without laughing with Tony Storm playing in my head with the various iterations she calls all the commentators, yep. including Tony, yep. my head. Yep. But 
Tony Schiavone calls out Adam Copeland to come to the ring. Adam Copeland cuts the promo. Essentially, it sets up for what we knew was coming all along. He wants to get back at Christian at some point. You know, he's enjoying the Cope Open challenges, but he's ready and that he's picked up some wins. He's ready to fight Christian once again. Which then props Daniel Garcia to come out. And the two have a back and forth where they both make pretty good cases. The fact that both of them have had a hot streak over the last couple of weeks. They both have picked up wins. I think it's only fair that they too have a match to determine who should go face Christian, which Copeland agrees with and says that the last man standing after Wednesday will go on to face Christian for the TNT Championship. And I was like, oh, cool. You know, this is kind of face. And then we get my favorite part with Copeland. As they leave, he goes and shakes the hand. Daniel tries to leave. <laughs> Adam pulls him back in on the mic. It's like, you better be ready because I'm going to kick your ass and then leaves. I was like... This is, this is all I needed. This is perfect. And it answered the question I wanted. So I'm like, so is Christian not defending this title at Revolution? Oh, never mind. We are. Cool. Now, we talked about a little bit about this. I'm rooting for Danny to win this thing. I love Copeland. And I think he will get his shot later down the line. But I feel that this would be a good litmus test for Daniel Garcia. Though I also kind of don't want him to lose to Christian either. <laughs> but who knows? Yeah. I, I'm pulling for Daniel Garcia to face Christian at Revolution. Yeah, it, it would be nice um, because if Daniel Garcia got, got the win over Adam Copeland, I mean, that would just shoot him to the moon. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you know you know, Adam Copeland is going to do his be do the best to, to put him over. You know what I mean? Uh, so then going into uh, with, Christian, with Christian Cage, yeah, I think that would just be icing on on the cake if Daniel Garcia beat Christian. I think that that would be great. Um, you know, the uh, to me, and maybe I'm on this island by myself, but like the patriarchy thing has just has gotten kind of stale. Um, you know, especially after the. Um, you know the okie doke that they that they pulled or adam copeland you know won the tnt belt but then you know luchasaurus was gonna we don't need to rehash that um yeah. but you know it's a weird story choice for sure right carry on <laughs> so i feel that that storyline has just kind of like grown complacent you know mm -hmm. so I, I i feel if daniel garcia did beat christian cage and won the the tnt title i, I think that would inject some life into that into that storyline you know uh, but like again that maybe that might just be Go me ahead. on my little island no no i like i like what you're saying there I, I i feel like i don't really have an opinion just a prediction i see danny beating adam copeland next week and then i see danny beating christian because of adam copeland mm. that's kind of how i see it it, it keeps the Christian Cage and Adam Copeland feud going without a title, and then it gives us a yeah. brand new story where you can have, you know, um, what's that youngster's name that that works with the patriarchy? The old uh, Nick Wayne. Nick Wayne. Nick Wayne. You could have him feud with Danny. You could have yeah. Kill Switch feud with Danny. Like you can yeah. move yep. him away, and it's like, hey, go get me my title back while I take care of, you know, my yep. oldest you know frenemy and it's like all right we got two extra matches out of this like this one feud i would like that i think that would be yeah great. right see i like that idea because then it fixes the issue that i had this is that i love the patriarchy as a faction because i love all three individual talents mm -hmm. however we haven't really utilized nick wayne and I... kill switch slash luchasaurus to their fullest potential yes. right now because it's been christian cage at the forefront as it should be, because he's the leader of this little faction. I would just like the TNT but, to go back to being defended on TNT weekly. Yeah, <laughs> that's the other part, too. I love Christian as champion, but we haven't seen that thing defended post World's End. And I'm yep. like, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. And then finally, our last backstage segment before we get to our next longer match. We see our favorite little dysfunctional family of Stokely Hathaway, Willow Nightingale, and Chris Statlander. Mm -hmm. I love this little dysfunctional family, but what this does, it does everything that we talked about on Rampage. And then we're setting up them revisiting some unfinished business because Willow calls out Sky Blue, yep. 
Sith Lu, as we refer to her now, that she's all in black. And essentially, because of everything and the history that they had with, you know, Willow and Sky getting misted by Julia, and Willow succeeding in not turning to the dark side where Sky has embraced it. And basically, this sets up the match that I've been wanting for a very long time since we had this whole saga happen. Willow is going to be taking on Sky next week on Dynamite, and I'm just like, the plot thickens, yep. we're continuing to tell this story, and I am super excited that we're revisiting these four women on, you know, the history that we've had with the TBS Championship scene, and I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to be mad if these are the four that are involved in the TBS Championship scene for the next month or two. I think all four are very stellar. Julia has organically won me over, and I love her as champion. And I'm excited to see where the story goes between the four of them. Keep Stokely Hathaway, Stooley, keep Stooley Hathaway as the <laughs> mouthpiece for Chris and Willow. Because that whole, you can, sh you can shop at Hot Topic all you want. Mm -hmm. Like he was just, he was entertaining. And I mean, Chris and Willow, they know how to cut promos, but it's not... I feel they're it's they're, they're not the strongest at it. So to have Stooley as their mouthpiece, I think mm -hmm. it's just like like we had talked about. I think I think it's I think it's perfect. I think they're a perfect they're a perfect dysfunctional family. Yeah. And and yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I agree. I enjoy I enjoy this. I'm enjoying this four person feud with uh, these four women. I think it gives them the limelight. It gives us more women on the roster and. I'm a massive fan of Willow. I feel like she is, she's going to be world champion here soon. I think the moment Mercedes debuts, I believe that one of the early people she will work will be Willow because we've seen their history together. And I think that Mercedes is someone who really enjoys working the same people over and over. It, it's a comfort level thing. So I think that that is a feud that's going to happen. This is all setting up. It's, it's tons of TV time for her and then if stokely decides to betray them and join over with somebody like a mercedes because we know mercedes can't cut a promo to save her life so this would be good for her to have somebody like this but as for now i love this i, I think this is perfect and nobody needs to talk for julia she's 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 a gem of a mic so she's yeah. just really uh, and good. and her uh, uh her and uh sith blue um, I, I feel like they, they do their best talking when they're not talking. I think that they that they have harnessed that ability to mm. act without speaking, you mm. know, uh, just in their in their face uh, reactions and, you know, the smirks they give and their posture, you know, like when they had at the end of Rampage, when they had that stare off, you know, you didn't need both groups barking at each other, just yeah. the way that they communicated with their, with their bodies was, was great acting. So yeah, agreed. Absolutely. Sometimes nonverbal uh, actions and nonverbal acting tends to speak the largest amount of volume. Speaking of people with large volumes, and this is not Fat Shave Brody King because he will squash me in a heartbeat, but we get into our next more lengthy match. Oof. We have Brody King Oof. representing and honoring the House of Black, taking on Mark Briscoe. Oof. So I enjoyed this match. I was really surprised. I was like, oh, wow, Cannonball Brody. Okay, that was really quick. <laughs> I was like, we got into the can. I was afraid as soon as I saw Brody's Cannonball. I was like, oh, please, this isn't going to be a squash match, is it? Mm -hmm. And then it went on for a couple of minutes. I was like, okay, I'm okay with this. I have said this on multiple occasions. I understand that sometimes the rules of professional wrestling, we play hard and fast by them sometimes, but I'm like, why do we have a table in a non-disqualification match like this? Like, there was a table. I mean, we ran into some chairs. There was not a count out. Look, I'm not saying that we have to follow the rules of professional wrestling, but I need you to make these rules make sense in the context of what we're saying, because I was like, this is not a this is not a no DQ match. This is not a street fight. Like, there's a whole table. We got a chair. I enjoyed those spots. Don't let me make that clear. But in the sense of this, I was like, we kind of didn't need it to be here, but it was fine. Mm -hmm. I am hopeful because I want to see Briscoe 
continue to feud with House of Black because it's a new story. It keeps House of Black on the television screen. Also, shout out to Julia Hart with the ending, which we'll talk about. Well, we'll talk about it right now, and then we'll just talk about this whole thing. I really enjoyed it because she takes out this little pin. Little and as pin. I had to. That was, well, that was a freaking nail, man. Hang on. So let me let me, let me get there. So yes. Yeah, so it was a big size pin, and I had to pause. I'm like, wait a minute, what is that? So I looked at it. And I'm like, so I don't know if anyone else picked up at this. I consider myself a very spiritual person, but I'm also understanding and because of my brain, I'm always wary of like, you know, mysticisms in various culture. I looked at that thing and I immediately recognized it. I'm like, oh, this is the direction we're going. I kind of dig it. That's a needle that you use for a voodoo doll. Like the way that it's shaped because it was a lot bigger than it normally was. And then the flat end of that whole needle, I'm like, this is a pin for a voodoo doll. And she literally stuck the needle into Mark Briscoe, who is a human voodoo doll. I was just like, please let there be a voodoo doll in Mark Briscoe now in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Like, I'm I like, did not okay. just stick him. Okay. Okay. That might be a little too far for television, but you never uh, listen. We see people bleed on occasion. On no, that was I, 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 I did not take that take away from that just because first and foremost, I thought the match was great. Um, and uh, I actually think that it's probably my match of the, of the night. Um, the thing that kind of made me forget about time and space was after after Julia Hart stabbed Mark Briscoe and it cut to the one camera that was like face on and Briscoe moved his hand and his head just started gushing. Like that... I don't know why, because I, I am comfortable with, I mean, I'm a father of three, so I am comfortable with all sorts of, of bodily fluids. But for whatever reason, seeing his head gush like that, I was just like, well, I, okay, I need to time out. <laughs> and I forgot about everything else that happened. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think this was interesting. I, I know this serves like a a purpose and it's supposed to push the narrative that like Mark is like this uh, he's gonna have to fight from the bottom and he's gonna have to make it all the way up to Malachi or whatever but this is just another indication for me is like that I don't believe Ring of Honor Ring of Honor talent is ever gonna be taken seriously in this company like this is how many Ring of Honor people have taken L's on this show tonight or last night yeah, fair. No, fair, I mean, fair, fair. it's. I get it. You're this. This is the one outlier. This is the one where it's like, okay, well, this is, you know, House of Black is supposed to be so much for Mark to overcome. He's gonna need help. Where's this help gonna come from? You know, like obviously that's a thing, but it's just like usually in professional wrestling, this would be the one loss for Ring of Honor, and the rest of the show they would have gotten like wins or you know disqualifications or whatever but like i don't know i look at it and i'm just like this might be the most compelling story that i've seen now you know obviously like i don't know who's gonna come help him i don't know if he's gonna bring bring him on a talent with him like maybe julia gets her ass kicked by athena who knows like it all depends on what mark brings with him uh but that would be cool because she deserves to be on television but I don't know. I guess I was just like kind of thrown off by this whole thing. I was like, all right, I get it. You know, I've seen the Briscoes in their fair share of death matches, so I, I, I get it. It just wasn't really for me, I guess. Yeah, and you know, that's fair too, because one of the things that, ha like, we talked about this last week, I don't mind keeping Briscoe and House of Black on television more because I think or individuals are very talented and i am enjoying what we're getting so far but i also had that question too because mark briscoe right now well mark briscoe is now officially all elite like when he signed he's more of an AEW talent more so but cannot forget his stint in ring of honor because <laughs> literally he's power the foundation the whole entire world. I am excited to see where this story goes, but I'm also cautiously optimistic because with the rumors swirling around that Matthews and 
Malachi have their contract coming up, you know, towards the middle part of this year. I'm interested to see how quickly we progress the story and what we end up doing with this. And I don't know. I, I'm more okay if, you know, Malachi and Buddy end up going out on their back of this company, so to speak, if we build this feud up properly mm -hmm. and, you know, the rubber match that we have with House of Black is great. It's just going to depend on who Mark ends up bringing as backup, which I'm not saying that, you know, it makes or breaks the match, but if you're going to build up to this culmination of where it gets goes nuts in the match between these, whenever we get this three on three, whenever it happens, it does kind of matter who Briscoe picks as backup because that's going to make or break Briscoe when he wins. But also you're probably going to want to pick talent that you, in my opinion, I would pick talent that is on the cusp of stardom and I would pick them be like winning over House of Black is going to push them further mm. into the limelight. Like, and I don't want to throw, I don't want to be mean like this, but like, let's say Briscoe picked Lethal and Jarrett. I'm like, nothing against mm, them, but I was like, yeah, that's not yeah, who I would pick. Yeah. No. I would pick someone like, you know, I mean, he's busy right now, but I would pick someone like a Daniel Garcia. I would pick somebody like a Lee Moriarty. Shoot, honestly, if we're going to go with Ring of Honor too, you got the infantry. You have, the Iron uh, let's see. The Iron Savage is as funny as it would be to see, oh God, Mark Briscoe and the Iron Savage is talking, but you want to pick talent in ROH, or even if you're going to pick single stars from ROH too, you know, you have a Dalton Castle, you have, you know, Jack Cartwheel, and you know what? Even if you bring in former ROH boys too, to help out with that as well, like, the point being in all this is, it's going to be important how we build up this feud when we get the ultimate rubber match down the line, it's going to make or break when we look back be like, this was a really good feud or it's like, it was great until the end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I agree. We're still in the infancy stages of this whole story. So we'll just need, again, I say it all the time, wait and see, cautiously optimistic. Things that I was also optimistic about, the 30 second promo we got, finally, the one thing I've wanted since he's been in this company, we get this quick 30 second promo from the bounty hunter, Brian Keith. Learn about where he stands. Want him to bring the bounty po wanted poster gimmick into AEW. Like that would be the best thing. It's one of my personal favorites. This is what I've wanted for the longest time. You know, his in-ring ability is great. Give me 30 seconds to understand who his character is and what he can do. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, that's all I wanted for this. And it served his purpose. Cool. Now let's, the only thing I ask now is let's get the bounty hunter some wins. Yep. Agree. Yep. Next. Like so we're going to put these next two matches back to back because technically they were back to back. We have both women's matches concurrent in this little segment. So first, Deanna Perazzo versus Kiara Hogan. I love Kiara, but this was not my favorite match of hers. I feel that it took her and Deanna a little bit to click. But then once they started getting into it, I thought it got better. Deanna obviously picks up the win here. Makes me sad my girl Kiara is losing. <laughs> So again, there's that. And as Deanna is celebrating and she's walking up the ring, then we immediately go yep, yep. into Time of Tony Storm's entrance, where she also takes on another talent that made me cry to see them lose in Queen Aminata. This match I preferred over Deanna and Kiera because Queen and T Tony, I love the interactions they had. They had the good wrestling. There was like, some fun comedic spots with like the butt attacks, which was great. Yep. And this actually was given a lot more time than Kiara and Deanna, which was very surprising to me. Then again, you have your champion. You're going to get more time with the champion. Yep. It made me sad to see Queen lose, but Timeless Tony Storm picks up the victory. And then Tony cuts a promo. She's going to debut her new film, Wet Ink. Take that as you will. Uh, on Dynamite. And she basically calls out Deanna. It doesn't matter how many special maneuvers you have. I will answer them. You know, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> I was I, like, and then she ended this whole thing. She's like, I'm going to erase you like a wart on my bum hole. I was yeah. like, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, match. So match wise, um, I agree with you, Mikey. The 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 Diana, um, 
Kira Hogan match. Why was I going to say Red Velvet? It's Kira Hogan. Uh, I'm watching too much ROH, Mikey. This, I, I blame you for this. Um, <laughs> um, Good. <laughs> Uh, the Diana, the, the Diana, um, um, see, I'm going to do it again. Diana and Kiara. And Diana, <laughs> Diana and Kiara. Uh, it, it started off slow. Um, and I don't know It to me, it felt, it felt kind of st- stagnant, uh, the whole way through. I mean, wrestling wise, uh, was, was it bad? No, but there was like at least to me there was there was no pop in the match. Um, the the pop came when Tony Storm came down and walked pack, past Diana. Um, I found the the Tony Storm Queen Aminata uh, match a lot more entertaining. Um, I enjoyed the the silliness and the seriousness of it. Uh, I feel that it, the, the my favorite part of the whole thing though was just that Tony Storm spot because she just she's coming off like so unhinged and just like I, you know I love that it like she takes the she takes the assignment and flips it on its head you know instead of standing in the ring and like calling out Diana you know she lays down like a Hollywood mm-hmm. starlet. You know, and she's all just like, oh, you know, my, you know, and, and Diana is almost like an afterthought to her new movie premiere that's coming on Wednesday. Uh, so, yeah. you know, that if we look at it as as a whole segment where mm-hmm. it was Diana, Kiera into Tony, Queen into Tony spot, it felt that feels like a more put together story and more enjoyable. Uh, but watching it like, uh, Diana, Kiara, Tony, and then spot it, it, I didn't like breaking it up like that. If that makes they sense. blended it really quickly and there yeah. wasn't a time to breathe in between. Them yeah. Two. If that, so if the sometimes, sense, yeah, what I said, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you don't necessarily need to have a moment to breathe between matches. From an execution standpoint, while it did get everything over, I feel that having these like literally back to back with no break, like just immediately jump in. And I get that they're trying to one up each other, but I feel that it kind of took away from the feud that we got with Diana and Tony. And more so, it kind of took away from, you know, Kiara and Queen also in a little bit because they're just being used to as as I call it here, they're being used as cannon fodder in the sense that you, you want to keep Deanna and Tony looking strong into this. But I feel that if you spaced it out, maybe have a match and maybe something in between, and then you have the second women's match, it would have been spaced out. Uh, Luis, quick thoughts on <laughs> this whole entire thing. I had a very old school approach to this. I felt like this was one of those, like, um, you go out there and win a match, I can go out there and win a match too. Like kind of like an old school type of feud. So I felt like that's why they needed to be back to back. The only problem is, is that I believe that Queen is a better worker than Kiera. So I think that Tony was able to get more out of her match. And yeah, I I do feel like Deanna had struggles at the fact that she she didn't really mesh well with Kiera. And I think it showed. Um, but the finish was great. Like the Russian leg sweep into the arm bar. Like that was a f- great finish. It looked really yeah. like it was fluid and everything. So I just feel like at this point, I feel like Diana's being wasted because I feel like what we're getting out of Tony is like legendary, uh, storytelling. And if all of this culminates in her just beating Diana, that I don't know how that helps her. Like I would have, I would have kept these two away from yeah. each other, and, because like, what's the point? Like, are we? I'm looking to the future. Is if Mercedes coming in, you know she's jumping right to the title picture. I would rather her jump to the most important champion in the company, which is Tony Storm, than for her to come in and take the title off of Diana. So I can't see how Diana wins the title right away. Like Mercedes isn't coming in to lose. We know that. No, for sure. 
And that's something that I brought up initially when Deanna made her debut. And this, AEW has a track record of doing this every time they get a big signing, they immediately throw them into the title picture. Immediately. They lose, then they get lost in the shuffle. And I'm just like, I hate doing that. Honestly, if I'm being completely honest, I would have rather had Deanna pick up a couple wins, maybe have a few that is non-title related for a little bit, and then you can throw her to Tony Storm. Mm -hmm. But I feel that because with the impending debut of Mercedes Monet for the women's division, and potentially maybe seeing Okada also do a double thing from there. Yeah. I feel that like, all right, Mercedes is coming in. We got to progress this storyline. Oh, look, Deanna, she had a we built this feud. She loses to Tony. And so much as there are other women, like she gets lost in the shuffle. Honestly, if I were booking this, I would have had Deanna come in, you know, face somebody like, I don't know, maybe, even though I don't want to see either women lose, like throw her to someone you know is reliable to have Deanna have do a match with. Like, and there's history there. I would have rather had her go up against Thunder as her first feud coming into AEW and then move her to Tony yeah. because there is history between Thunder and Deanna, you know, from Impact a little bit. They also had their little feud for like the AAA women's title, like La Reina de Reinas. Like there's history there, but we've thrown Deanna into the situation. I'm excited to see her get all the screen time because I'm a big fan of Deanna. But the inevitability is we know Deanna's losing at Revolution. It makes me sad because then afterwards, I'm afraid she's going to get lost in the shuffle like all the women do after they lose the championship, after they lose their first championship match in AEW. But we have three weeks until Revolution, which is really weird to say because we're still trying to build this. I'm like, now I need another dimension into this. Game. We've had the promo between the two. We've done the one-ups in for a little bit. Would love for Deanna to ruin Tony's movie next week as an added dimension, which would be hilarious. But I'm ready for another dimension to be added before we head into the final thing, which is Revolution. That's what I want to see. Then we get to our main event for the AEW International Championship. Orange Cassidy taking on his chaos stablemate, Tomohiro Ishii. This was personally my match of the night. Mm -hmm. I always do worry when Ishii walks down that ramp the way that he walks. I was like, oh, buddy, we, you have seen some stuff. Yeah. You have gone through some stuff. Yeah. And I was like, half the time, I'm one, I want to believe that it's a character choice because he is the stone pit bull. Yeah. But at the same time, I was just like, your body has been bought. Do you even have a cervical spine anymore? <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> That's like, the way? Yeah, just the way he, I'm just like, yikes. Uh, now, I'm not making fun of Ishii because he'll beat me up in a heartbeat. I really enjoyed this match. It had everything I wanted. We had the comedy bits. I love the fact that Ishii continues to be presented as the Stone Pitbull. Like, it takes a lot for Cassidy to knock him down a little bit. Yeah. Very interesting and acting you know choices with yeah. Orange Cassidy, this match. That part. Very interesting <laughs> acting part. choices. Not, uh, not, and I enjoyed them. I'm just saying it's acting choices that I had not seen. I have not seen from Orange Cassidy, uh, and uh, and I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, like I enjoyed the match. like when yeah. when he started doing the uh, the Hulk Hogan uh, psych up, and then all of a sudden just passed out. Like that was interesting, uh, but that was weird. But, <laughs> but it, it, I, I felt like it helped the match. You know, because like Ishii was just kind of like was getting ready for it. And then he drops and he's just like, are you going to count? What's going on? You know what I mean? Um, I, I thought it was a, uh, I thought it was an entertaining match. Uh, you know, uh, all joking aside, uh, Ishii does have, does he does look like a pit bull when he, when he comes out. Um, and he, I mean, heck, he, I know Ike is sleeping on the other couch, but you know, he, he has that posture like. Uh, like my, he, like is my the, he is the human form yeah, of the house, you know, um, <laughs> and yes, you, uh, you need to have someone that like starts punching him and he no sells, you know, and yes, like that person that punches him keeps punching him and then tires himself out. Mm -hmm. I thought that that, that was a, I thought that that was a, a great acting choice, you know? And it added more to the comedy when orange Cassidy started doing his thing where he's just like, you know, 
uh, just because, you know, so often you do see it going the other way where Orange Cassidy, you know, he'll get someone in, in, into the turn, into the turnbuckle, you know, and then he'll just like either do the slow kick or the slow hit and then he'll ramp it up, you know, but this was a, this was a flip where he, he came in ramped up and he was like, this isn't working. Mm. And then Ishii, you know, came in and, and pounded him. So I, I thought, I thought it was a good story. I, I, I thought it was a good match. I thought it told a good story. Yeah, I agree. I, I gotta, I gotta talk about this from like a worker standpoint. I really feel like a lot of young talent in AEW can do themselves a service by sitting down and studying Orange Cassidy. This is a man that has been doing the same character for 10 plus years and he has perfected it. I believe this character works in any company on the planet. He is, he has figured out a way to be such a difference maker. And what I love most about him is because of his size, he works from the bottom a lot, which is something that a lot of the people in AEW choose not to do. We even see it with sometimes with, with Daniel Garcia, like he's not a bigger guy either, but he works like he's a bigger guy. That was so, there were certain wrestlers that that was special with, like a guy like Eddie Guerrero who worked bigger than he did, but that was because it worked for Eddie. He had spent years working from the bottom, so now it's his turn to be like the bigger guy in the match, to be like the aggressor. But when I watch Orange Cassidy work, I, I think to myself, I was like, this guy, I, I don't understand how he, it's been five years in, and he has slowly progressed to be the best character in the entire company, and they have for some odd reason, kept them away from the world title. I don't get it. I don't understand if there's like a pecking order. I know that there was the rumor of the promises that there was a specific, like the way the title was supposed to go from man to man. That's why, you know, um, that's why the punk thing rubbed everybody the wrong way because he wasn't the next in line for what they had planned. But when I watch Orange Cassidy, I'm just thinking to myself, like, this is your star. This is the biggest dude in the company. Like I genuinely believe that they can, they can maximize him and sell out arenas with him and he can do everything. I could see him on talk shows. I mean, this demeanor on like good morning America or yeah. something si silly like that, or like anything he does. And then hit, for him to be able to work any talent that you give him, whether it's somebody from Mexico, whether it's somebody from Japan, whether it's somebody from Ring of Honor, anytime he works a talent, it feels like the biggest deal. His title to me is the biggest championship in AEW. And, and I don't think it's close. And I love Samoa Joe, been rocking with that dude since like 2002. But to me, the international championship is the title that I would want. It feels like the the 80s and 90s intercontinental championship where it's like all the yeah. young guys that were coming up were like this is the title i want this is the workers title and he's such a great representation for this championship too and yeah I, i'm 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 just happy and i think we're blessed that we get to watch this guy work dare I, dare i say orange cassidy has shadows of Bret the hitman heart yeah oh i agree with you I, I can't I can't disagree with that. Like Brett is the only champion in WWE or WWF history that ever made that championship feel like it was it was the biggest deal ever. Yep. Nobody has ever made that champion. Like you hear the you hear that weird like little catchphrase like oh like the wrestler makes the title or the title makes the wrestler like they made each other. Like that championship yeah. was Brett's mm -hmm. title. And that's how I feel about this. There's only one other worker in the business right now that I see doing the same stuff that Orange Cassidy's doing with this championship, and that's Glinter. I don't think anybody else yeah. is doing this level of like mastery with their championship. And I would I would go as far as saying that Orange Cassidy's just a step above him. Like I'm not saying he's a better wrestler, I'm not doing that, but I'm saying what he's done for this championship, you can see how important Orange Cassidy is to this championship because when they took it off him. The championship was kind of lost, yes. which I, that which yep. is why I think your Bret Hart comparison is perfect. That's a that's a perfect comparison. Yeah, yeah. Well, because because you know, much like Orange Cassidy, Bret Hart, you know, he he got the Intercontinental title, uh, you know, and then uh, he and then he worked his way up and he got the the championship and he and he embodied that, mm -hmm. you know. Agree. Uh, so. 
yeah, uh, I. It would be nice to see Orange Cassidy get a, get his shot at, at the title if he wants it. That's that's the other thing too. Like if if he wants mm. the the championship, like I wouldn't see why not. Uh, I think he'd be a great champion, but like he might, for personal reasons, you know, not want to go after the the AEW championship. But yeah, um, yeah. Uh, match wise, again, great match. Love it. And we talked about this earlier, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Undisputed Kingdom come out. Uh, you know, they try to beat up Orange Cassidy. She comes back in the ring. Trent follows. Orange Cassidy is just lying on the floor, recovering as we go off the air for collision this week. Again, <laughs> I feel the whole thing with Undisputed Kingdom. This week, it did not need to be here, especially because, you know, I thought they were going to attack Ishii, but they went after Orange. I was like, well, okay. Story, but neither here nor there. Gentlemen, this was an interesting collision. Let's go into our final ratings. I'm gonna go to Adolfo first. What is your final rating for this week's collision on the Empanada scale? Uh, my final rating was uh, a seven out of nine. Uh, you know, it was it was enjoyable. Uh, I definitely, after I got done watching it, uh, was like, oh, that that was that was it. Wow, you know, so it had me engrossed. Uh, I, there were some missteps, but f uh, I feel that for the stories that it was uh, trying to forward and uh, that it was telling, um, and the stories that it wanted to start, uh, I feel like it it did a it, it did a good job. Um, we talked about this really uh, a little bit on on the rampage review. I don't know if this is because of like this new backstage. Um, writers leadership whatever what have you uh that made people leave aew like if if this is kind of like the direction they're going i'm i'm digging this direction or if this is you know left over from what they wanted to do and then like halfway through the year we're going to see the new direction of aew uh kick in but i i'm i'm enjoying f for the big picture i'm enjoying the direction that AEW is going right now so and and this this fed into that this this added into that louise your rating this week i'm gonna give it a four out of five and put on us i really thought that it answered questions that we have been asking for a very long time it gave us a lot of women's segments yeah you know i thought that was a big deal uh, it also answered the question, like it let us have more time with Brian Keith. So instead of introducing him last week, giving him that top moment and then ignoring him this week, they immediately went back to it the following week. So I love that. Uh, I thought Orange Cassidy alone could have like just his match alone would have given this a four out of five. And, um, you know, I just thought this, this was a really good show it was interesting uh, my only gripe with it that I won't give it a five is just find other people to make look like jobbers instead of an entire brand. That's my only issue. I'm going to be the middleman. I'm going to give this a seven and a half, kind of for the similar reasons as both of you have mentioned. I enjoy that we are heading towards revolution and we're building up stories, not just for the pay-per-view, but on the shows themselves. Though there are some pivots I may have, would not have chosen in terms of the execution of certain things. Like I think Undisputed Kingdom really didn't need to be here. Mm -hmm. That whole segment didn't need to be there. I mean, just them coming out to beat up on Orange Cassidy would have served enough. Uh, there were some missteps in some execution and chemistry in ring wise, but I still thought this was an enjoyable show. Seven and a half for me. We have reached the end of this week's collision <laughs> review. This was a fun one, and I enjoy reviewing it with my two other co-hosts here. It's a great time. Make sure to check out all the other stuff we got going on here at the Biconic YouTube channel. Follow us at BC WrestlePod all over the social medias for fun stuff. And if you can't commit to watching our beautiful faces in video form, let our voices carry you through all the different things you got going on in your life as we have audio versions of all of our reviews podcasts and things like that you're out here so 
So make sure to put us on as background noise while you're taking a test, while you're taking care of business on the porcelain throne, where apparently a lot of you do that. So we're okay with yep. that. My voice will, will my back. voice will help bowel yeah. movements. <laughs> so we will be back in two weeks because there is no collision next week due to, you know, the NBA All-Star Weekend. But we are so excited to come back knowing that there is going to be a collision two weeks and then we will be inching closer and closer to revolution. From myself, Adolfo, Luis, and the rest of the Biconics boys, remember, take care of yourself, love one another. And as always, stay Biconic, all you guys, gals, non very nary pals, he, she, theys, and gays of the internet. We will see you in two weeks, but until then, Billy Stark's outro. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in to another Vibe Tribe production. What's going to happen next time? Well, you're going to have to tune in to find out. But until then, remember, take care of yourself, love one another, and as always, make sure that you keep the good times rolling. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time.